Sometimes, prayer can transport us through realms we have neither the will nor the strength to traverse ourselves. For Vera Schlamm, the power of prayer led to an uncommon act of forgiveness in the aftermath of one of history's darkest hours. When Hitler came into power um, and he was voted in, I remember the way I found out about it, that I think it must have been a Sunday morning that my father read it. I went to their bedroom and he was reading the paper and Hitler had voted in and he said, that's not good for the Jews. And uh, I remember that. And of course I found out after, very soon afterwards that that was true. <laughs> I don't remember a whole lot. I do remember my best friend who had been with since first grade uh, telling me that she couldn't be my best friend anymore. She couldn't be my friend anymore, period, because I was Jewish. November 10th was crystal night. That's when the Germans went all through Germany and uh, organized mob action, burned all the Jewish places of worship, demolished all the Jewish-owned stores. That's why it's called Crystal Night, because so much glass was broken. We had to start wearing the yellow star, which said you on it, uh, in Dutch, J-O-O-D. For Vera Schlamm and millions of European Jews, the Star of David became a symbol of relentless persecution. As Adolf Hitler's Nazi party grew in strength and numbers, its chilling master plan for world domination began to unfold. It was a plan that called for the extermination of the entire Jewish race. In 1938, Vera, along with her parents and sister, fled her home in Berlin seeking asylum in Holland. Within two years, the Dutch were suppressed by the German war machine. And in 1943, the entire Schlamm family was ordered to a Nazi concentration camp. We get, got to the station, they were there with their dogs and, and terrible language. Immediately, the, the fear started. The fear never left you. You didn't know from moment to moment what they're gonna think up next to do and so forth. So. That's how we got to Bergen Bells, and the first day we stood the whole day in the snow, my mother started coughing up blood. They took her to a place just alone in a room to die. They didn't feed her, they didn't do anything. They just left her there. The Schlams quickly discovered that they were now trapped in a punishing cycle of fear, pain, and exhaustion. Disease and death were constant companions and the faint hope of survival darkened with every passing day. After I was in, in the camp maybe a couple months, uh, a 10 months old baby was brought in by himself, had been in prison for a week, accused of being Jewish, and the Jewish camp doctor asked me to take care of him. He was a typical 10 months old baby. I mean, at first, you know, he was just sitting up, and by the time he left, he was standing on my lap and jumping up and down, and then I got very attached to him. I tried to adopt him. We thought if I adopted the baby, we could bring him through. And my parents fell in love with him too, just a few short two, three weeks that they experienced him. But then one Tuesday morning when the lights went on and a thousand names were called, his name was on the list, and I had to get him ready to go, and. That was very traumatic, and I remember that very distinctly. And I went around borrowing diapers, I mean, not borrowing, asking for diapers because he had to send it with him, and and some food, and I pinned a note on him saying what he ate and all this kind of stuff. When they carried him off, I knew that it was all in vain and that he wasn't going to make it. And I really prayed the whole time and asked God to deliver us out of that situation. I was at the point of starvation. I didn't get up to get my food anymore because it was too much more effort to get the food than to have the little bit of food. So it was a miracle that we got out. 
In January of 1945, the war in Europe now drawing to a close, Vera and her family were released from Bergen-Belsen. After two years in Holland, the Schlams immigrated to the United States. And with remarkable determination, Vera set her course for a new life. During the next 12 years, she would graduate from college, medical school, and then establish a pediatric practice in Los Angeles, California. There, in 1961, she began caring for the infant son of a young couple, Milton Lisa Palmer. She came in and she bent over Tommy and she had such a love for this baby. And she was so sweet and so soft-spoken. I think I fell immediately in love with her as a friend. She was so sweet. The following year, Vera often visited the Palmers at their home near Lake Arrowhead, California. As their friendship deepened, she turned to them to help her truly know the God who had delivered her from the horror of the Holocaust. She would ask me questions, showed me how interested she was. And then a couple times I came home from the church and she would take care of our little son, Tommy, who was two years old in 1962. And I'd catch her having put Tommy down for his nap. She'd be standing in the doorway with the Bible in her hand, looking at it, reading it. I always prayed, I always thought about my relationship to God. And so I think I gave my heart to God at that time. I floated off the mountain, <laughs> I really did. I was just, you know, in high heaven. And um, he hasn't left, he's still there. Within a few months, Vera's new belief opened her heart to an almost unimaginable decision. Could she forgive those who had inflicted so much pain upon her life? I could sense that somehow in Vera's heart, the, feel, the negative feelings that she was feeling and should be feeling regarding the terrible things that were happening in her lifetime before she came here, um, that somehow they were getting too big. I was worried that it would stand between her and the Lord. I probably talked about the Germans this and the Germans that did this and they did that and so forth. So Mrs. Palmer, uh, said to me, you know, that attitude is really not pleasing to the Lord. I pointed out to her the scriptures and said, talked about loving your enemies, doing good to those that despitefully use you. I advised her to, to let's pray and see if we can't find forgiveness uh, for these people. I guess it was more that I was so hurt by the Germans and I had to let the hurt go. And so it happened to be around the Jewish holidays, so it was a time that I was used to asking forgiveness for sins anyway. And so I went home and went on my knees and asked God to take that away from me and take care of it. And he did, and he lifted that burden. As she talked to the Lord and asked him to give her the strength to forgive, and that is prayer. Everything is based on prayer. So yes, without prayer, there would be no forgiveness. By forgiving them for my part doesn't mean I'm letting them off the hook. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. I'm not saying they should go scot-free. I'm just saying I'm leaving it up to God. We just studied the Lord's Prayer yesterday. We asked, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's just as plain as English can be. The Bible says it was good for me to be afflicted because it brought me to you, brought me to the Lord. And to me, that is worth it all. That's worth every, every heartache, every misery I went through just to, to know that he has a purpose for it all. You can see, I hope, the peace and joy that I have. You know, I don't, sure you get emotional over the pain you went through and uh, baby you lose and, you know, that's a hard thing. But, um, I don't think you can do it without the Lord.